migrants, Menendez, so many things to talk about with my favorite pair of pundits, O'Brien Murray and Hank Sheinkoff. Let's start with, dare I say it, Senator Menendez. Um, he says he's not going to resign. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Why should he? He's uh, got a popular uh, basis of support in the state. He's uh, allowed to face trial and be a look at the accusations by themselves. Uh, and uh, he's a guy who hasn't frequently been caught. You know, he's gotten away with all kinds of things, people would say, but tough guy. He's not going anyplace. It's Hudson County, by the way, and they don't give up. New Jersey's got the history, too, with Torricelli when he resigned and Lautenberg came in there. He's, Menendez is smart enough to look at the election calendar and see what goes in there when and what the deadlines are. So if he resigned right now, it would do anything to benefit him as far as his, his, his criminal case is concerned. It won't benefit the Democrats right now other than a talking point, possibly. So he'll stay there as long as he can until he decides what's going to happen to the Senate. And he's got leverage now, and he's got his kid. He's got his son in office. I mean, he's got things at stake. He can use power right now to protect his interests and to protect his son. Very important to him. But here's my question to you. You know, there's, there was a Supreme Court ruling that uh, set very stringent uh, limits as to how political people could be charged with corruption. Is he hoping to use that Supreme Court case to try to get out of these charges? Well, he should. The, the Supreme Court case, I think, was much more about those that received gifts and what the the reasons were the quid pro quo. You're a lawyer on this one, but, but the reality is if there's not a quid pro quo, there's nothing there. If it's just an outright payoff or something, it's something else. This is, but this is different. You're right, but this is different. Here's why. There's an element of involvement with a foreign nation at the, at the expense of the United States government, which is really serious. Number one. Number two, <clears throat> the feds don't like to let go. They've got a hook into everybody in Hudson County that was brought in to give testimony against Menendez, and this is going to go on for a while. Well, it's a 40, what, 45 page indictment, and then there's pictures, and there's I mean, a lot, lot of stuff written there. So. so, but here's the other question. As we know, in his previous uh, corruption trial, he beat the case. It was a case that was tried in New Jersey. This time, they brought the case in Manhattan for some reason. And, um, you know, there are not people here who are as familiar with Bob Menendez and might be less forgiving in the jury pool. I mean, do you think that they brought the case in Manhattan for that reason well, to make it more difficult for him to get off? The Southern District, the joke in there is always, they have th their jurisdictions, anything that touches the Hudson River. So so they were able to get across to Jersey. Anything that happened if you set foot in New York for, that, that's all it takes. So the idea to come to the Southern District is, is I guess, smart on the Fed site. Get it out of New Jersey. Get him out of his people that voted for him. And people don't know him here. Hank? Um, the Feds don't like to let go. They had him. They nearly had him once. They want him. The place to get somebody, if you're going to get somebody, is the Southern District of New York, where the politics are less important than the, than the reality of the law just the way it goes. So let's go from Senator Menendez to Senator Dianne Feinstein, who passed away. And the question is, who replaces her and how fast do they do it? Well, if I'm the, if I'm the governor of, uh, of California, I appoint a black person, black woman probably, to position myself better to be president of the United States. But we ought to talk about Feinstein for a second, Marsha. I mean, the day George Moscone, the mayor of San Francisco, was shot, she stood up, took control. Her career is an extraordinary one. And, um, you know, it was a heck of a way to see her go out at 90 the way that she did. With, with Harvey Milk, too. And don't forget, she came in as a liberal senator. Right now, as they talked about whether or not she should finish her term, the progressives said she was too, she was too moderate. So here is a woman that came in, set a path for what she did, uh, and, and yet still on her way out now is too moderate for the electorate out there in the Democratic primary. Well, so you but a black woman? What about the vice president? Well, I mean, there's, there's somebody to name there that would really shake up things as sure. far as the Democratic Party is concerned, take a lot of concern out of replacing Harris. If, Harris were to, if the vice president were to step down from vice president and go to the Senate, it's on her terms. She chooses. She'll get a seniority back and some. Sure. She, uh, Lautenberg had that same deal cut with Torricelli sure. when he came back and sure. gained back his, his seniority. Well, there it, could be a lot of movement there. Does it help the Biden ticket, the presidential ticket in 2024, to have somebody else on the ticket? Absolutely. Why? Because she doesn't bring a benefit to them right now. He, she brought a benefit at the right time back then. Now, after four years in office, there's an issue about what she's done or not. People can argue both sides of, of, of that argument, whether or not she's been good or bad for this president. But now he gets a clean slate. Blank canvas. Would be the polling numbers are terrible. That's a clear indication that it's time to make a change if you can. Yeah, but, but he can't just make a change just to make a change, don't you think? Because that could alienate women voters and people in the African-American community. But if she goes to the U.S. Senate, she's choosing to do so. Much no, no different than DeSantis and Newsom have this debate coming up in November. That didn't happen without her okay. If she had really banged her fist on the table, yeah. that would not be happening. Newsom is a team player for Biden and for Harris. You're onto something very important. 
look, she does this, she does it as a patriotic gesture. Women's rights are at risk. <clears throat> the country's at risk from crazy economic policies the Republicans want to put in place. She becomes a patriot, which would be a very good thing for her. And it goes to what Obi was saying a moment ago. It's her choice. She becomes somebody that people then have to reckon with in a very different way. If Newsom's going to appoint a black woman from California for the U.S. Senate, wouldn't she be the most qualified one, the one that was in the Senate, sure. that's now vice president, sure. that knows the lay of land in Washington? So if that were to happen, who would you think the, the president should pick as a running mate? I think it's a, it's a blank canvas. I think he gets to go to the polls, see where he needs to be shored up across this country, what's going to work for him in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and other swing states. Let's think of it this way. White, blue-collar, Catholic men want to go want to be Democrats if they could. They've left. They want to come back. They're angry. They're Trumpites. You want to bring them back, get somebody from the Midwest who understands jobs and protecting whatever's left of America's industrial base. Whitmer would be good. The governor of Michigan. Amy Klobuchar, the senator from uh, Minnesota, would be good. Somebody from that world that they can relate to. Does it have to be a woman? Well, ought to be. I think, I think if you replace an African-American woman with somebody, there has to be a woman or African-American at least, one of the two. So let's go from the Senate to New York City. And Mayor Adams has been under the gun dealing with the migrant problem. Is this the kind of a problem that is going to cost him re-election? It is not just the migrant problem that he faces. It's the attacks on the left, which are not insignificant. It's the fact that the police department does not have the numbers it needs and can't do the job it needs to do, not because he did it, because the council did it to him. It's the state of the jails. It's everything he inherited from Bill de Blasio, including a capital budget that doesn't have a dime in there to build a school. I mean, these are tragic things that occurred, but that he can't blame de Blasio for. The historic thing. Why can't he blame de Blasio? Too late. He's gone. Nobody remembers but, de Blasio. And the migrant issue wasn't when de Blasio was here. And, and it wasn't a creation of the mayor right now. It came onto his lap, and he's had to deal with it. And the Voters are going to evaluate how he dealt with it from day one. But the reality, too, is on the re-election, with ranked choice voting, you could have two progressives, if not three, run against him. And if he doesn't get 50 percent in the first ballot, and there's two of the progressives that run, and they say first and second choices, all of a sudden, whichever one comes in third falls off, right. and that person goes up above 50 percent. That's the weird thing. But, he can have well, multiple people run against him for ranked choice voting, and we've never had that before, where they could unify. You're very smart. I can't do mathematics. I learned from you, Hank. Ah, but I do know a couple of things. You have a progressive who wins... Uh, who wins the Brownstone Belt in Brooklyn, wins the West, wins, wins Manhattan, takes Riverdale, the games, it's game, set, match. But that was Garcia last time, too. That wasn't this mayor. He won that, she won that against Adams, and that was the New York Times endorsement, but, too. But, the, but now the mayor's numbers are different, and people have had a sense about him. The question is intensity of black turnout. It's not, this is not, he's not, it's not a Dinkins phenomenon. This is a, a beam phenomenon. The city is going to go in fiscal paraxis. That's pretty clear. You put all that together, he becomes immediately the advocate for the city in a very different kind of way, where, he's, where he gets people up and says, let's go like Ed Koch did, or he could be done. And he's got two budgets. He's got 15% cut right now. What's going to happen next time around? And what's this president going to do during an, a re-election? So we have about a minute left. Let's throw some names around. Who do you think would challenge Eric Adams for the mayoralty? Well, the obvious ones are clear. I mean, Lander would be a difficult, depending on where Adams' numbers are in, in the spring. Um, Quinn would be a difficult one. Christine Quinn. Christine yeah, Quinn. Absolutely. AOC. Would, would, would have fun trying to do it. Not that she's credible enough in that regard to run this city, but when you're talking about a progressive that can generate low-dollar low donors with matching funds, name ID, and go out there and bang her fist on the table, if that's what they want, a rebel rouser on, on the progressive side, she can go out and have fun with it, and she gets a free pass, doesn't give up a congressional seat to do it. Jessica Ramos. What about her? Her name's been bandied about. Be and Ramos versus AOC be interesting because the two of them really don't get along well nowadays. Well, it, it's really, it's interesting to watch. I mean, you need people around Adams that he can delegate authority to almost instantly or this ain't going to work out well. I think Ramos doesn't have the name ID either right now. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it right there for now. A lot of more to talk about. You'll be back sometime soon. Anytime. Thank you for joining me and thank you at home as well.